Well, good morning. Welcome to Yarrow Lions Church. My name's Sean. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is good to see you this morning. It's a, it's a special morning. It's Palm Sunday, so we turn the corner today into Easter week. And um, I hope as you're joining us this morning, you found your way via our website. You should be watching either via Facebook, live streaming, or YouTube. So uh, just show of hands this morning. How many of you are watching on Facebook right now? Just put a, put a hand up for me. Yep, thank you. I see those. Thank you. Jordy, how are the cinnamon buns this morning? I hope they're good. Uh, how many of you are watching on YouTube this morning? Okay, show of hands. All right, good. Good, good. Good to see you all. So anyhow, here we are. And uh, this morning, what I want to uh, introduce to you is, is just the context, the setting, and a passage of God's word that points us towards the cross as Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem and there was this great party that broke out as the city welcomed Jesus into their midst. So listen, friends, as I read to you this morning from Matthew 21. And as I read, I encourage you to take this posture of let's welcome Jesus into our midst this morning as we share in God's word, as we share in worship together. Uh, so friends, Matthew chapter 21 says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples ahead saying to them, go to the village uh, beyond us and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, placed cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd sped their cloaks on the ground, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Let me read that last bit again. It's a beautiful picture. Something that we want to pray into this morning. It says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, asking, who is this? Friends, would you pray with me as we begin our Palm Sunday together? Father, we give you thanks this morning for your faithful presence in our week. Thank you for your kindness to us and your good provision over each one of our lives. Father, this morning as we enter into Holy Week, the week of the cross, the week of the resurrection, we begin with this, this entrance into Jerusalem. And so, Father, we welcome your presence in our midst each and every day. But this morning, it's our focus and our desire to meet with you uniquely in this hour. So we welcome you here into our homes, into our circumstances, into our hearts. And as Jesus, your son, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and began to ask questions of him. Who is this? What is the purpose of Jesus? What is this great celebration? God, would you stir something within our hearts this morning as we listen to your word and draw near to you? We pray you would stir those who are watching, whether live or, or in the hours to come, as uh, many people are tuning in to explore your word, to connect with the body of Christ, to seek you out in uh, days like these. Father, we pray for those who don't know you, that you might be stirring something within their hearts of lifting their eyes and their attention towards you at times like this. Father, we pray for our kids that you'd stir excitement in them this Easter week, not only at uh, the events or the treats or the things that will come, but excitement that we know and serve a risen, living Jesus Christ. Father, stir something within each one of us today. Tune our ears in to hear from you. Meet us this morning as we worship you together and draw near in your presence. We ask all of these things, Father, in the name of your good Son, Jesus, who we love and follow. Amen. Well, friends, again, it's good to be with you. And if you're just joining us, my name's Sean. And I'm the lead pastor here. It is Palm Sunday, 
And we've got a few things lined up that we want to share with you before Pastor Cam opens the scriptures to bring us the word this morning. So up next, we've got Pastor Dan bringing you some announcements. And so I'm going to turn things over to him and we'll carry on from there. Hi, I'm Pastor Dan, pastor of Community Life here at Yarrow Alliance Church. And we're so glad that you've come here to celebrate Jesus today. If you're just checking us out or are new online, we also want to say just a special welcome to the service. We are also right now in the middle of making meals for the people in our community. And we have had a wonderful response. Also, if you are still wanting to make a meal, we still need a little bit more for the weeks to come. If you're interested, please contact me by my email or text. We will also be having, on April 10th, a Good Friday service online. And if you want to check that out, it's at 10 o'clock. We will be doing the Stations of the Cross, so it's going to be really exciting. Also, too, if you want to give, please don't give cash. But if you have a check, you can drop it off in the mail slot at our office on Federal Road. Also, too, we have other options of giving, too, on Facebook, as well as our website, where it says Give. And please follow the directions on that. You can either do e-transfer or giving online or direct deposit. So be sure to take a look at that and use that service. And now, back to the service. Well, what is Palm Sunday all about? And I thought, oh, Jesus riding on a donkey. And donkeys, they like apples. And Jesus riding on a donkey was, they were celebrating. And when kids like to celebrate, they like cupcakes and donuts. So when you put the two together, you get donut apples. So today we are doing donut apples. You need apples and you're gonna need some cream cheese. And then you're going to need some things to put in your cream cheese. So I put melted chocolate in one. I put peanut butter and honey in another. And just plain honey in this one. And then I also have my trusty band-aids because you're going to need a sharp knife. <laughs> and you might need your mom or dad to help you out with this. So to start off, you take your apple and you're going to make apple slices sideways. So be very careful. Use... Um, Get your mom, dad, older brother, sister to cut very carefully down the side. Make them nice and thick. And then I'm going to stop there because I've already got some ready here to go. Then after you've got your slices, you want to take something that will make a nice round circle. You want to take it and Cut out the middle. And if you don't have something round like this, you can use a spoon and you can maybe just cut away in the middle so that you get your nice donut shape. Then, this is the fun part. Take your, I'm going for a chocolate donut. I don't know if you figured out, but chocolate is like my favorite. I'm gonna make a chocolate donut. Spread it on the top. And make it as thick as you want. Make it as delicious as you want. Because we love our chocolate. Then, let's see, I'm going to put my coconut sprinkles on it. Doesn't that look like a lovely chocolate donut? I'm going to make a peanut butter one. Take my peanut butter. And take another knife. And you're going to spread your peanut butter on this. And I'm going to use a little bit more. Now, Palm Sunday is all about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And he went and he asked his disciples to get him a donkey. And they went and found him a donkey just where he told him it would be. And they went and um, he brought it, they brought it back and then he was riding the donkey and the people they went and they were so excited because Jesus was coming and he had done so many miracles. He had healed people, he had 
saved people. He had uh, made the blind see again. He had made the lame walk again. He had made food that he had multiplied food. He had done so many miracles. They thought this is just the best ever. So they cut down palm branches. They threw their jackets on the floor, on the ground so that he could ride on it. And they were just celebrating him. Just, they were having this huge party. They were making like a red carpet and having such a great time. And it was just like one big party. And it was big celebration time. And so now I've got my peanut butter and my M&M and chopped nuts on that. And my last one is a very special one. I'm gonna make it, this has just got honey in it. And I'm gonna put, it's got cream cheese and honey. And I'm gonna make this one very special because it reminds me of the word Hosanna. And how does that make it? special to you. So, if you have gone swimming lately, <laughs> or, and the lifeguard has to save you from out, if you've gone a little bit too deep, you'll notice they take one of these life preservers and they will throw it out and save you and rescue you because the word Hosanna means save me, rescue me. And so the people were yelling Hosanna to Jesus. They were saying save us, rescue us because he was the king that they thought would come and rescue them. And in Luke 19 verse 10, it says Jesus came to save and to seek those that were lost. And Jesus is like our lifesaver. He is like a rescuer. He comes to save us and to seek us and and the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, because they knew he was their king coming to rescue them. And we know, boys and girls, that Jesus has come to save us. And we also know that God's promises are true. And we know that these donut apples are going to be truly delicious. We'll see you next week.
still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, yes, it will. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithful.
Well, good morning, Yarrow Alliance Church. It's good to be with you. Uh, even though it's through technology and I can't see your faces, it's still good uh, to, to have church together and still have community. I've got, I got my Facebook Live on right now, and so I can see all you guys checking in and liking and commenting, which is great. So why don't you just tell me, like, who are you watching with? Uh, why don't you tell me maybe like a highlight from this week, something you were able to do through this pandemic time? I know for me, uh, one of the things that was cool is, is I got to celebrate a birthday for a friend out in Calgary. Uh, and so it was great. We got to go on Zoom and there was like 20 of us celebrating um, this girl's birthday. And it was, it was sweet because I would have never been invited to this birthday party uh, if, if this pandemic never happened. I wouldn't be able to get out there and see them. But because of technology, uh, I was invited and I got to celebrate with them. So that was something super cool uh, that I got to be a part of this week and a highlight for sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little jealous of you guys, that you guys are at home on your couches. I mean, this is like the first time in a few weeks I had to put on real pants. I've been wearing sweatpants and shorts for a few weeks. All my meetings have been on Zoom, so as long as I look presentable from the shoulders up, I'm fine. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys are nice and comfy on your couches with your coffee and your breakfast. Um, and so if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I'm the youth and outreach pastor, which means I get to have the most fun on, as, on part of the team. And I still like to play that I, like I'm new. I'm the new, the new guy on staff. And so I joined in the summer, so I'm closing in on a month, or I, sorry, a year. Um, but I still like to pull that I'm new card. And before I moved out here in July, I was actually in Toronto. Even though I was born and bred in Alberta, I went to school there. I was in Toronto for about 10 months last year, uh, finishing up my schooling through an internship at a church out there. And it was actually a great time to be in Toronto. Uh, not because it was like good weather or, or anything like that, but because of the sports and the excitement that was happening around there. Like they have all the sports there. They have a football team, the Argonauts, which honestly no Toronto person actually follows. They don't care about it. Uh, but they got a soccer team. They got TFC. Uh, Toronto FC, they've got, um, obviously got the, the Blue Jays, which, I mean, no one was really following because they're, they're kind of rebuilding right now. And there's the Maple Leafs, of course. And there's always a high expectation, a lot of buzz around the city about them. And every single year, they let their fans down. Um, and we all know, like, the best team in the league is the Calgary Flames. Like, who's going to cheer for the Leafs when there's the Flames in the league? And, I mean, no one's booing me right now, so I know you guys are all agreeing that the Flames are the best. So that's good. Good you guys are on the same page with me. But actually, the, the most exciting thing, the most exciting sport event team in Toronto last year was, was their basketball team, the Toronto Raptors. And the Toronto Raptors are still kind of a new team. They've, they've only been in the league for about 25 years, the only Canadian team. And because, because of that, joining in the league, they were pretty crummy for a long time. For 18 years, they, they struggled. They only pulled off five seasons where they're above 500, where they won more than 50% of their games in 18 years. And because of that, they could not get a fan base. Uh, nobody's going to go and wants to watch a, a team that's just getting beat up every single night. And so they struggled for 18 years. Uh, but eventually, they're able to, to develop some players, draft some good players, make some moves, and put a team together. In the last few years, they've been able to make playoffs and work their way, getting through the first round, second round. And last year was, was a was the time when they made it to the finals. And so there's a lot of buzz throughout the whole year of this is the Raptors year. And so being a part of that, um, I, got, I followed, followed the Raptors, watched games. And as we got into playoffs as a top seed, uh, there was so much going on. There's so much following, so much press about it. So everyone was talking about the Raptors. And, and fans began to flock downtown Toronto. And Downtown Toronto, there was actually a screen outside, and they called this Jurassic Park, where people would go and watch, watch the game outside, thousands of people. And every single round of the playoffs, it would build and build and build, and more and more people would go down. So much so that by the time they got to the finals, people were lining up for a full day ahead of the game just to get in to watch. In the street, a big giant screen in Jurassic Park. And so I knew, like, I need to go down. I need to be a part of ju this Jurassic Park experience at some point. So I called up my, one of my buddies that I, I met in Calgary, and he was living in Toronto. And so we went down, and we went down, and we were, we were late. We didn't get into the first, the main Jurassic Park. But because it was so busy, they brought out three more massive screens that, like, filled, like, at least, like, five lanes of the street. And they had to shut down streets. And we got into the last one. 
And there's, so there's a screen, like a thousand people, and then another screen, thousands more people, a screen, thousands more people, and then one last screen with like another thousand people. So we were cheering with a bunch of fans, and it was going great. And got to the last play of the game, game five, and they called the timeout. The Raptors are down by like a point, and they put a play in to give to one of their all-star players, Kyle Lowry. And the, Kyle Lowry gets the ball in the corner for a three, puts it up, and they missed. And you could, it went from crazy wild cheering to big, big gasp of, is this ball going to drop, to dead silent when it didn't go in. And you could literally hear a pin drop on the ground because as every single person didn't say a thing, everyone just turned and went to the train. And so I was like, okay, well, I, that was only game five. They got game six. They can still pull this off. And so a few days later, I went back downtown with some friends, some people from the church, and we, we ended up getting into a restaurant somehow. We showed up super early, so we were like, Let's, we want to be able to eat and enjoy this a bit more. So we watched this game from this restaurant, the sports bar type place, and, and they go through the game, and they, they're winning most of the game, and they come out at the end as champs. Spoiler alert. And so this restaurant went crazy downtown. We're downtown Toronto. It was going crazy, high-fiving, hugging everyone, celebrating, and we're like, okay, let's go like actual into the streets and see where everyone else is, where all the people from Jurassic Park are going to be. So we walked down and it was madness. There is Dundas Square was full of people. You literally could not move. I'm like low-key claustrophobic. And so I'm like kind of freaking out, but like still celebrating at the same time. People are climbing buses and cop cars and buildings and traffic lights. And it's just this giant celebration. And it was so much fun and so cool to be a part of. And even though there was a ton of people down there, the real party didn't happen until four days later where the Raptors were coming back to Toronto and there was going to be a a Raptors parade, a championship parade. So Monday morning, I had Mondays off luckily, so I went downtown with some people from the church and we got in line and we stood on the street and we celebrated with over 2 million people. Over 2 million people in the Toronto area came down to this, even though some people flew in to be part of this parade. And we just got to celebrate the team coming in with that trophy. And so I share that with you today because this morning we're actually going to dive into a story found in the Bible of a great parade. Of a guy coming into a city and people leave that city and, and put lay things down and celebrate and shout for his entry. Uh, and so today, uh, before we actually get into that story, uh, let us pray together. And prayer is simply this. If you're, if you're tuning in, you've, you're not really a part of this church, you know what this Christianity thing is all about. Prayer is simply just talking to God. Prayer is, is simply uh, having a conversation with God. And we believe that God is real and we can talk to him and that he also speaks to us um, through his Bible, through other people, and even uh, one-on-one with us. So would you join me as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for yeah, just who you are. God, we thank you that you are, you are sovereign and that you are in control of everything. And you know everything that's happening in this world during all this craziness um, and all the things that are changing and moving and, and all the uncertain times that you are God and you are in control. So God, as we come together uh, this morning, uh, whenever we're tuning in, uh, we, we give you this time. God, we pray that you would speak through me God, that these words would be your words and not my own, and that that this morning we would uh, see who you are, Jesus, and we would meet you, Jesus, um, and see your truths and the power you have and you want to give us. So, Jesus, would you be here this morning? Thank you that you are here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this morning we're going to be diving into John chapter 12, and if you have your Bible, you can turn, make your way there. If not, I'm going to uh, it's all, ki- all good. I'll be reading out of the CHV edition, the Cam Hutchinson version. Anyways, so you might not be able to follow along that well. But before we dive into that, I just wanted to give you a little context. So what, what's happening in this story? We're picking up in John chapter 12. What's happened before this? Why is this book even written? And so John is this book that we call a gospel. And it's part of a group of four books called the Gospels, M- Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in these books... They're essentially just a biography of Jesus, and they follow his whole life from his birth uh, a little bit in his teenage years and growing up, but more specifically when he's about 30 to 33 in what we call his public ministry. And so we're, we're picking up about a little over halfway through John chapter 12. 
And so would you, yeah, just join me um, as we read this. But before that, let me share a little verse of why also this book was written. We find this in John chapter 20, 30 to 31. And it says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written about in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so as we go through this story, would that just be a reminder that this is written so that you know that Jesus is the Son of God and he is the Savior and we can have life through him. So let's pick this up. John chapter 12, uh, verse 12 to 19. And so we pick up the story and it's during a great festival. And this festival, this holiday is called Passover and it's this this week-long tradition that the Jewish people, the Israelite people have been following for, for many years. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a celebration and a time to remember the, thing, the ways God had moved in the past. And so if we go to the beginning of the Bible, second book in Exodus, we find this story where the Israelite people were actually slaves to Egypt. And in Egypt, they were, yeah, slave laborers, they had to build everything, they were tortured, they, they lived a terrible life. And this is not the dream, the, the idea that God wanted for them. This was not the life they were supposed to live. And so he calls them out and he says, to, to the Israelite people, I have a land for you where you guys can prosper, where you won't be slaves anymore, and I'm going to lead you there. And, but obviously, Egypt did not want to give away their, their work, their work people, and, and um, these are the people that are they're building them and making them a great nation, and so they didn't want to let them go. So God sends 10 plagues, uh, one after another, that kind of take out the whole city, and it took 10 plagues, 10 destructive plagues, before Egypt finally let Israel go, let the Jewish people go. And so this time um, of Passover is a time to celebrate and to remember what God had done in the past and leading them out of captivity and out of slavery. And so that's why um, we're, we're, so that's what's happening during this Passover time. And because it was such a big deal, lots of Jewish people would actually make a pilgrim, pilgrimage to, uh, to Jerusalem, the holy city, the main city at the time. So lots of people were flocking to this area and filling the streets and hotels and staying there. So it was packed during this time. Uh, and so there's this great Jewish crowd there, but they began to hear that this Jesus guy was coming to town, that Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem as well. And so this excitement, this buzz started to build up. Uh, and so people began to get excited and, and they wanted to go meet Jesus. And they weren't going out to like shake his hand and do a little meet and greet and have an autograph and have a conversation there. No, they're actually going to be making a giant parade. And so they all left Jerusalem and they even grabbed some palm branches from, from the area and they would lay them down and make a path, like a red carpet for Jesus. And they lined this path and they started celebrating and shouting. They shouted words like Hosanna, which means save us. They saw that Jesus was going to be their savior. And they, what else did they say? They, they shouted, bless is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless is the king of Israel. And this is, all before, um, this is all before they had even seen Jesus. They're already shouting and celebrating before Jesus had even arrived and gone through this parade. Now, if we, if we move from Jerusalem and see where Jesus is right now, Jesus is preparing um, to get into Jerusalem. And he's doing this by, as we heard a little bit earlier from Pastor Jan and Sean, that he actually gets a donkey. And he's riding in on a donkey. And I don't know about you, but like, if you're going to be going into a parade like, why a donkey? Like, the donkey is not, like, an appealing animal. It's, uh, it's not a powerful animal. Like, if you could choose anything to ride in on, like, why aren't you choosing, like, an elephant? Or why aren't you calling up Joe Exotic and getting a tiger? Or uh, why not a horse? Like, a horse was a representation of, of royalty and of warfare. And if the people believe that Jesus was going to be their coming king, their king for the future, don't you think he was coming to Jerusalem to overthrow and to, to actually take over Jerusalem. But no, he chose a donkey. But why a donkey? The donkey is a humble, unintimidating animal. You know, it's something you would want to get an Instagram pic with, something you would pet, something you would feed. Um, but it's not something you're going to jump onto and go into battle with. Uh, but the, the donkey was actually a symbol of, of peace. And so when people in those times were riding a donkey and political uh, people and and people going into cities, by riding a donkey, they're symbolizing, we're not here for war, for violence, for anger. We're actually here to make peace with you. 
And so that was how Jesus was entering into this city. And so he chooses a donkey because uh, we see in verse 15 that there's some scripture quoted from the Old Testament. Before Jesus was alive, about 500 years before Jesus was even born, this is written about him. And it says this, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. And daughter Zion is is making reference to Jerusalem and to the, the Jewish nation. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And so, uh, in here we see that 500 years before, we, Jesus was actually supposed to enter into the city on a donkey. And so that's why he's on a donkey, to fulfill these scriptures, to prove that he is the king and the savior of the world. And all during this time, Jesus had about 12 disciples, uh, and they were following him. They're about anywhere from about 12 to 22. So they're still young and different backgrounds. Some of them uh, were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors, doctors. So some were, had lots of education. Some didn't. And they had no idea what was going on. They didn't know this scripture that this was actually supposed to happen. That Jesus was supposed to go into Jerusalem on a donkey. They really had no idea what was happening. They were just following kind of blindly, just rolling with the punches. And they're just, yeah, just doing what they're doing um, and seeing what's going to happen. And so now we see, we have Jesus who's coming in with his disciples uh, on a donkey. And then we see a giant crowd in Jerusalem. But there's also still a crowd that had formed with Jesus before this all happened. Because Jesus was going through the land. He was teaching. He was performing miracles. He was healing people. And he was causing people just to drop everything and follow him. And right before this whole story happened, one of the craziest miracles in the Bible uh, is, is read and we can read and it has to do with Lazarus, one of his good friends, actually passed away. And for four days he was dead. But Jesus goes, he prays, and commands him to wake up. And he comes back to life. And so obviously this is a huge deal where people are like, what? This Jesus guy has so much power, so much authority. He has to be God. He has to be the son of God. And so lots of people are following Jesus now. And so he has a huge crowd walking into Jerusalem with a huge crowd waiting for him. And we see that these two crowds are going to meet as they celebrate and as they worship Jesus uh, for all the good things and the things he's going to be bringing them in the future. And all while this is happening, we see, we, we end this story with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are these religious leaders. They're kind of the spiritual elite. They're the people that uh, that people looked up to for, for guidance, for wisdom, for how to, how to follow uh, God. And these people are not angry. They do not like Jesus. They actually send out reports and, and orders that if the Jewish people knew where, G- where Jesus was, they're support, supposed to report back to them so that they could go out and arrest him. And so eventually they could kill him because they did not like what he was doing. And so in verse 19, they're talking amongst themselves and they see this. See, This is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And that's where our story ends for now. But I want to pick up kind of from this conversation of of these Pharisees of, of look, uh, we are going nowhere, right? We have no more influence. And, And they're actually upset about this. And so why are they upset? If these guys are the religious leaders of the time, the the Jewish leaders at the time, they know the scriptures. They should know that this coming king should be coming eventually. This coming king needs to come, is is supposed to enter and and save the people. So why are they upset? There's over 40 prophecies, 40 texts in the Old Testament talking about that Jesus is the savior, this Messiah, the son of God is going to come. So why are they upset that Jesus is finally here? It's because it threatened the way they lived. It threatened all that they had, right? As, as the leaders, they had influence, they had power, they had control, they had authority. And with Jesus coming in and being this person, they lost everything they valued. They lost their control, their power, their influence. They lost their, their, pretty much their, their livelihood in a way, you could say. And it would change the way they would have to live from here on out. And if we go into earlier into this book of John, in John chapter 5, we see Jesus actually speaking to these Pharisees and calling them out. And we see he says this, speaking to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So we see is, yeah, these Pharisees, they understand the scriptures so well. Like it's probably memorized. They could, 
you know, recite it, all these things. And yet, Jesus is here. Jesus is the fulfillment, and they're not buying it. And they're trying to put their, all their hope in knowing the Bible instead of going to the person. And they're, they're upset because if they actually go to Jesus, they have to give up everything. They have to give up their identity. And at the same time, they're realizing that they're losing, they're losing their influence. And Jesus is far more attractive than anything they can offer the Jewish people. And so what, what can they actually offer the Jewish people? They're offering them religion. Religion, as in rules, as in regulations. Laws. More rules and laws to help follow those rules and laws. Standards, rituals, lots of judgment of, don't do this, you can't do that, look at us, we're perfect. Bunch of traditional traditions, a schedule, a calendar to follow, a certain way to live. And all of this restricted their life. And people were done with it. They, didn't, they hadn't given up on God. They still believed in God, but they felt so restricted. They had no freedom. They felt like they didn't have life anymore. So much so that these people who went to Jerusalem for this festival abandoned it all. Right? They had made plans. They took vacation time. They invested money to stay in a hotel or, or stay with friends and, and make their way to Jerusalem. And yet now they're dropping everything to leave and to go meet this Jesus. Jesus was far more attractive. He could offer so much more uh, and bring so much more value and purpose into their life. People were done following the Pharisees. And they saw the exact opposite in the person of Jesus that they saw in the Pharisees, which is why they went out to him. Right? Jesus had been had going over the, all the land. He'd been teaching and speaking and, and sharing things that they've never heard. Sharing with authority, but sharing things of, of, of heaven and the kingdom of heaven and how they can inherit it and experience it. Uh, talking about love and, and loving everyone, loving your neighbor as yourself. Just radical ideas at the time. To show mercy. Jesus was showing mercy to people that were abandoned and ignored and pushed to the side, were outcasts. Compassion to all, and he was intentional. People would invite Jesus into their homes, and he would say yes, and he would have a conversation and talk to them. Right? He was healing the sick. Miracles were being performed. Blind people saw, deaf people heard, paralyzed men walked, and even a dead man came back to life. He spoke with authority as he was the Son of God. And over time, people began to be intrigued. People began to follow and people began to believe what he was saying. They wanted to be free. They wanted to be saved. And Jesus was also just the exact opposite of the Pharisees. Jesus did not care about fame at all. He, if you read some of the stories, you see that he would be speaking to thousands of people. And then he would leave to go spend time alone. Like he didn't need to be the center of attention. He didn't need to be the life of the party. He didn't need to talk to every single person. But he would often leave and spend time with God. You know, he would heal people, and, and he would tell, tell the person he healed, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone I'm here. He, he didn't want to be popular and to be famous. That's what, he, he didn't come out here um, for that. And we see, if we go back into John 5, and verse 41, it says this, I do not accept glory from human beings. Like, he doesn't care how, how many Instagram followers he would have had these days, or how many TikTok views, people who would show up to his parties, um, how many people knew him in town, and how well-liked he was and loved. He didn't seek the approval of other people. And because of that, he could not be bought. He could not be manipulated. He could not be steered away in a different direction because he didn't need to prove himself to anyone. He didn't need to, 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 to win their approval and to please people. He did what his father told him to do. Right in, in chapter 5, verse 19, he did what his father, who is God in heaven, would do. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. So this is why people followed him. And if we compare uh, Jesus' following to the raptors following, um, where they ended up having over 2 million people come to this parade, just completely packed. How did, how did the raptors get their following? Right, people were skipping work 
Kids were skipping school. Parents were even taking their kids out of school to go downtown Toronto to be a part of this. Why was this such a big deal? How did they go from a crappy team being able to barely sell tickets to now tickets being worth over $200 and thousands of dollars for these finals? How did they go from, from nothing to everything? Well, it started in 2013 when, when they hired a new general manager and vice president, this guy named Masai Uriah. I probably butchered his last name. No, his first name is Masai. But uh, this Masai guy started making moves. And so he traded away players, traded for better players, uh, drafted well, you know, the face of the franchise, DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry. He got these players. And in 2018, he made the biggest move ever, one of the biggest trades ever in the NBA. The star player that arguably one of the, the best player at the time in the league was on the trade block. He did not want to play for his team that he was on, and he wanted to move. There was bad blood um, from him and his former team. And so there's a couple of teams who, who are m- most likely to actually be able to trade and make moves to get this star player. But things fell flat. And the Sai and the Toronto Raptors came in and swooped in a few days later as things were starting to settle and made a blockbuster trade where they traded away their star player, DeMar DeRozan, to the San Antonio Spurs for arguably the best player in the league at the time, Kawhi Leonard. And once Kawhi Leonard joined the Toronto Raptors, the expectation to win the NBA championship was now full on. They could not be stopped. Their expectations were high. There was no more getting kicked out of playoffs. They were going all the way. They had the talent. They had the team now. And as, as the season went on, the highest watched game during that season averaged about 700 views, 700,000 uh, views that day. And that was when DeMar DeRozan actually played Toronto Raptors once again. But for the NBA championship, game six, the finals, when they won it, almost half of Canada, 16 million Canadians tuned in for at least part of that game with an average of 8 million people watching that whole game at any given time. 16 million people from 700,000 people, right? Their Instagram grew. Once they traded for Kawhi and this expectation uh, grew, they, they gained over three quarters of a million uh, followers, almost doubled their, their fan base. Uh, what else? Their team value after Kawhi and after the win went from about a billion dollars to over two billion dollars, cracking the top 10 uh, most valuable franchises at the time. This team was something special, and two million people came down to celebrate and to, to support their team as they brought in that championship trophy. It brought basketball fans together. It brought Canadians together. It brought Torontonians together. But this was short-lived. This celebration was short-lived. About a month later, after Kawhi led the Raptors to the championships, he left. He left Toronto and he moved to and took a signed with the LA Clippers. And the whole expectation of, of Toronto repeating and, and going back to the finals left. There was no more expectation. They're like, they're still a good team, they'll make playoffs, but they're they're not gonna win the championship. And and they lost followers, and less and less people started following every single game. Jurassic Park wasn't a huge deal anymore, and, and people stopped following. Because basketball could not satisfy these people. Basketball couldn't give them life. Like, ball is not life. Sorry to say, ball is not life. Like, look around. Even right now, we can totally see that now when the whole league is canceled. We can't even watch NBA. We can't watch NCAA. March Madness was canceled. It was the saddest thing ever. We can't play anymore. Parks are closed. Rec leagues are shut down. We can't call our friends and play basketball nothing in this world can satisfy everything is temporary nothing can fully give us life but Jesus but Jesus Jesus is life this is why this whole book was written this is why the whole Bible is written to show that Jesus is the king the savior of the world this is why crowds flock to him this is why people dropped everything they were doing and left a city left a celebration to celebrate this one guy And in this celebration, we, we, we see three crowds. We see the crowd in Jerusalem. We see the crowd that's already following Jesus. And we see the Pharisee crowd. And so which crowd are you? Maybe, maybe you're a Pharisee. 
and you're, you're in this Pharisee crowd where, um, <clears throat> where you just, just can't let go of things and give your life to, to Jesus. You, you just can't. There's things in your way where you can't follow Jesus, where you don't want to admit that he is life. That you're holding on to things in your life where you find value in, like your job, your family, the money you have, your hobbies, your friends, whatever it is. And you were not willing to let that go and to follow Jesus. Maybe you're a person who's actually just following Jesus already. You've been with Jesus. You've been tracking with him. You're celebrating. You're sharing his good news. You've been with him for a while and you're walking with him as he's on a donkey. And I encourage you just to keep doing that. Continue to praise him, to worship him, even during these crazy times where maybe you've lost your job. Maybe times are tough financially. You're anxious. You're stressed. You're with your kids all day. Praise God for who he is. Praise Jesus that he does give life. Or maybe you're, you're in this place where you're here in Jerusalem and you've been going through the motions and you've just had it. It's not satisfying you anymore. You, f- you feel like you're in this routine and, and you're not fulfilled. You don't have a purpose. Right? Life kind of feels like a burden. You can't seem to break free from, um, from certain things, from sin, from things in your life. You try, 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 and nothing happens. You read the Bible because you feel like you're supposed to, but you don't get anything out of it. You do all these things. You show up to church. You do all these things, and there is no life in it. It's time to come to Jesus. It's time to stop doing it on your own, but to go to Jesus, to worship him and to meet him because he's coming and he is here and he's come for us. It's time to draw near to Jesus and to let go of these things and go to the one who can actually give us life. Jesus is near. Run to him. Pray. Speak to him. Don't just do it because you're supposed to or you're told to do a routine, to check things off the box. But Jesus is a real person. And he lived on this earth, but now he's up in heaven. And we're going to be talking about that story next week of, of how he really actually gave us life and how he actually saved us. As we talk about the resurrection next week, Easter Sunday, you need to tune back in for that, to hear about what he has to what, what our pastor has to say about resurrection and how he actually gives us this life. But during this time, whatever you're going through, wherever you f- find your, your landing in which camp, which crowd, it's time to drop things and run to Jesus, to spend time with him during these times and to seek his face. We have one last song for you guys we're going to turn over to in a bit for Amberly, from Amberly and um, and then we'll have a couple slides, so, so stay, stay tuned and, and watch that to the end. But I want to close with this, with a blessing for you guys. That we do every, every, every week, and it's just a blessing, a blessing of peace. So may the peace of Christ be with you.
Promise. 